Welcome to San Joaquin Spotlight, a public affairs program featuring conversations about life in the central San Joaquin Valley. This program is brought to you in partnership between KFSR 90.7 FM and CMAC Fresno. I'm your host, Sevog Tatiosian. Today in the studio is the one and only Armin Bacon. You've seen her work in the Fresno Bee. She's written now two books and multiple other items. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Sevog. It's a pleasure to be here. So last time you were here, things were a little different. Yes. What do you think? I like it. I love the <laughs> studio. I feel like I'm in Hollywood. <laughs> you know, and this is the first show that we've used the white background, so we're testing it. So yeah, you like? I hope I looked good in it. <laughs> Thank you. The reason why I invited you on the show today is because you have a new book out. Yes. And first, tell us a little bit about it. Well, the title is My Name is Armin, A Life in Column Inches. And that's kind of a play on words because I'm a columnist and, and most of my writing appears in column inches. And uh, the book is about my life, and it's about life in the San Joaquin Valley. And um, many people know that I'm a huge fan of William Saroyan. So the book is divided into five sections, and each section is anchored by a quote by William Saroyan. And it covers the gamut of my culture and Armenian roots, my family, friends, life adventures, and sacred advice that I've gathered along this mysterious and wondrous life journey. When you write, you write about passionate things. I mean, when you write, it's not just about, you know, life is great, all the great things out there. No. You write stuff that, that is real. Tell us what people tell you when they see you. I, I, I think people are so tired of living life on speed dial that, you know, a lot of what I write, I try to savor precious, fragile, small moments that if you blink, you might miss them. And I like to spend some time writing about those moments. And, and they can be moments when I'm in my car driving, or a moment, an interaction between me and my grandchild, or a moment in the kitchen with my mother. And people say, they like that style because they want to dig deep. They, they don't want to live life superficially. And I think in my writing, I try to show more than just the shiny parts. And I think we're all searching for that reality, for you know, permission to be real and to be authentic. And um, so in my writing, that's what I try to do. When I saw that your new book was out, I chuckled to myself because, you know, one of the last times that I talked to you, you were still working at the Office of Education. Yes. And so I thought, you know, she's retiring. Now <laughs> she's going to slow down a little bit when in actuality, no, you're moving much faster now than I've ever known. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, retirement for you is working. Well, in part, I retired because I had this fantasy that I was going to write. You know, my first book I wrote in the middle of the night. I, I was working full time, 40 to 60 hours a week. So I would go home from work, have dinner with my husband, and then say bye bye and go upstairs to, and, and, and start writing. And, and uh, I decided the second book I wanted to write in daylight. And so I had ideas, and uh, Fresno State invited me to publish under their imprint, the press at California State University, Fresno. And we really scheduled a very ambitious timeline for the book. And we wanted it to, to launch in November, to come out by November of this year, which it did. And, um, and I, you know, I love writing. I get lost in my sentences, and I, I have a wonderful family life, and I, I love people. My roots are here in the valley, and so there's really never a dull moment. I mean, I, I, there are not enough hours in the day for me, <laughs> but, um, but I'm doing what I love, and I think when you do that, um, you don't get tired. It's, it's, it's a good feeling, and it energizes you, and so I... I'm sort of a maniac, and I know some of my friends tell me, hey, you have to slow down, but right now I'm having the best <laughs> time of my life, so I really can't stop. I'm, I'm enjoying every moment of this writing journey. You know, in just two minutes, you, talked <laughs> about, you hit on stuff that I'm going to ask you okay. about, so thank you for leading into that. Your first book, when you wrote it, mm -hmm. you would have dinner with your husband, and then you would go up to write. How important is having someone like your husband that's supportive of you because you know I see you two out and you know I could tell he's very proud of you. Thank you. He is. You know, oh, it's it's very important because um, 
you know, like anything else, if you're going to do a good job, I mean, you, sacri you make sacrifices. And being a writer, um, I, I think I was sharing with you earlier, sometimes I write for five hours, and then I look at my writing, and I say, there's nothing here right now. And I have to start all over again. So it takes time. It takes sacrifice. And um, so I'm not sitting watching TV every night with him. And, but he's so supportive. And, and we have a rhythm in our life. I mean, there are, we have a date night. And, and we spend a lot of time together in, in, on the weekends. But I'm very devoted to the, the writing. Um, and I'm very devoted to my family. So it's, you know, this balancing act that I think all of us struggle with, you know, the work-life family balance. And, uh, but right now it's going well. And, you know, of course, having retired my day job, um, I, I write for at least five or six hours a day. Speaking of your day job, when you were working, you were at the Office of Education. Yes. How, had, how has that helped you in writing books, or has it? Well, well, it helped. You know, I did a lot of ghost writing for superintendents. I wrote press releases. I did. I oversaw all the communications for the Office of Education. So I was always writing. But that was a very different kind of writing. It was technical. Uh, it was always in somebody else's voice, not in my own voice. But it was. But I was writing. So it, the practice, the discipline of writing, was very important and very helpful. Um, but, you know, I've always enjoyed writing. When I was a little girl, I had pen pals, so I was writing letters, you know, from the time I was seven or eight until the years I was a teenager. When I was in college, I went away to school. I moved to Europe for a year and a half, and we had no email or, and, or texting then. So I would write elaborate letters home to my family, describing in embellishing lots of lots of lots of words, telling them about my adventures abroad, and and then when I became the uh, over, oversaw the communications department for the Office of Educa Education, I had to be even more disciplined in my writing. I had to write, you know, for news. And um, it's all helped me very much because now when I write for the Fresno Bee as an op-ed columnist, I'm confined. I have 750 words and I have to tell my story. It needs a beginning, middle, and end and, and a conclusion and a lesson, hopefully, or some kind of a poignant message. And so it, I, I learned about that kind of discipline while I was writing uh, for my job. How do you come up with your topics? Because one thing I've noticed when I see you in the Bee is... It, it's different. I mean, it can go from one thing to another. Well, um, I have paper everywhere <laughs> in my world. I have it in my purse, in my car, in my bedroom, in my kitchen. And I just, I get ideas. Or I'll, I'll listen in on a conversation. Or I'll have an interaction with a stranger. And it'll spark an idea. And I don't always know where it's going to go. But I have a running list, and I, and I read a lot, too. I, you know, I love reading. And sometimes I'll read a story, and it'll, jot, uh, it'll, it'll bring back a memory of mine. And, um, and then I'll make a note of it. And then I'll sit down and say, it's time to explore this idea. And a lot of it has to do with my own mood. You know, sometimes, I, you know, sometimes I'm in an energetic, you know, happy mood, and so I want to write an upbeat story. And other times I, I get very reflective. You know, I have an aging mom, and uh, our time together is very sacred. And, and sometimes, you know, it's very hard. Her, you know, she's, she's aging, and she has health issues. And I get sad thinking, you know, that I'm her caregiver. Um, and then other times, I'm with my grandchildren, <laughs> and we have a whimsical moment that's out of control, and we're walking and doing make-believe, walking around the block. So I have a lot of good material, and I think that's my blessing, is that I don't have to look for material. It's all over me. And, and I'm also enchanted by this San Joaquin Valley where we live. My roots are here, my family is here, and uh, you know, I think Fresno gets a bad rap. And so I can travel down almost any street of Fresno and come up with a beautiful storyline or an idea for a story because I've, I've traveled these roads and streets my entire life. And so there's a lot of good material. And, um, and I love being able to be a storyteller, a memory keeper. And you know, my grandparents, I don't know about yours, but my grandparents uh, came to this country they watched their family members uh, killed in the genocide, and they never shared their stories out loud. They never talked about their stories. 
And it's very important to me that I pass my stories on to my children and grandchildren. And so this book is dedicated to all five of my grandchildren. And, you know, sometimes we have stories and memories and we say, oh, I want, someday I'm going to tell my grandchild or my son about this. <laughs> and, and yet you think you're going to remember that story and it disappears. You know, you forget. So I'm, I'm really happy that I've been able to write these stories down and share them with my grandchildren. You mentioned something that I wanted to talk to you about as well is because I know people that won't tell their stories. They uh -huh. have remarkable stories. They won't tell them because it's too painful. What advice would you give for someone in that boat? Because there's a ton of stories that are going forgotten. Yes. Because the yes. person doesn't want to tell it because it hurts so bad. Well, you know, if it's somebody who wants to write their story or they're interested, um, I, I, my, my advice is, you know, buy a journal and you don't have to write it all at once. You can write it in five minute increments. You can write it one sentence at a time or you can write just jot little notes of memories. I mean, you don't have to write them all out. But then there will be times when you do feel like sitting down and maybe writing a page about the home where you grew up. I remember one of my first writing classes that I took in 2008, the instructor said, um, for the next 45 minutes, I want you to walk through the house you grew up in. And I want you to describe each of the rooms. Mm. And just in doing that exercise, and that's a safe exercise for most of us, to just go back to that, the home we grew up in and to take a physical tour and write about the physical artifacts, what the wall, what color the walls were and the wallpaper and the tables, where things were placed. Those, that in of itself brings back all kinds of memories. And so there are exercises, and there are books that, that, that have lots of writing prompts like that that will help you, guide you through that process. And again, you can do it one page at a time, one sentence at a time. And if you have, um, I buy journals at the dollar store, you know, a dollar a piece. <laughs> I buy 20 at a time, and I put them all over the place. And um, I would just say, whatever you write, make sure you put a date on it, just so y you have a date written down. And, and then start the story and then put it down for a while and take a rest and then pick it back up when you're ready. Did you always knew, know that you wanted to become a writer? And the reason I ask you the question is, it wasn't until later on that you published your first book. Right. But it sounds like you've been writing, you know, you mentioned pen pals, you mentioned long letters back home when you were a student overseas in Europe. You've always been writing. I've always been writing, but those dots only recently connected. I mean, if you would have asked me that question five years ago or ten years ago, I would have said no. But now looking back, um, I always loved writing. I remember having to, to do a report in sixth grade, and I, I, I wanted to do a report on Leonardo da Vinci. And, and I think the teacher said, you know, write about 15 or 20 pages, and I turned in a 100-page report. <laughs> so I, I guess writing was always kind of in my blood. And actually, my grandfather wrote a lot. And uh, I'm, I'm just, we're, we're, st we're still trying to find out stories and, and gather some of the things that he wrote and translate them. But I think in my family, there were, there were, there were writers. And, and so I think I got that, it's part of my DNA, but I, I love writing and communicating and making eye contact with people, whether that be in person or with words. You know, you mentioned that, you know, your grandfather loved writing. So is that next? I mean, I know that we're, you know, you just published this book. Uh -huh. What's your goal with this book and what's next? Well, this, this book is obviously a collection of my newspaper columns primarily. And I'm working on a couple of other projects. You know, my first book was called Griefland. And it was a story about surviving the worst day of my life and a story of uh, navigating grief and, and coming out the other end, walking through that fire of sorrow and, and heartache and, and, try, and surviving it. Um, as a result of that book, my co-author Nancy Miller and I have received hundreds if not thousands of letters from men and women saying, thanking us for our book and for creating a language for grief, but also they've, they're sharing their stories with us. And, you know, what we've learned is, and what I'm learning every day with both books, is the human spirit 
is very resilient. I think sometimes we don't give ourselves credit for being so strong and resilient. And um, everybody, nobody goes unscathed. I mean, you know, we're living in an era of loss right now. People are losing aging parents. They're losing homes and jobs. Women are losing breasts. And some people like us have lost children. And we received so many letters that we've decided and been asked to write sort of a sequel that shares other people's survival stories. That sounds, fa I yeah. mean, that sounds fascinating. Yes, and, and it's, very, uh, it's very hopeful, it's very positive, it's not a negative, it's a very uplifting kind of uh, book. And, and so it will, inc it will include uh, stories from other men and women around the country who have shared their story with us. And then I'm also, um, I'm also working on a piece um, in our culture. The kitchen is just the most sacred place <laughs> in the house. And, and some of the major decisions, a lot of life happens in our kitchen, in, the, in, in our Armenian kitchen. And, so, and I spend a lot of time with my mother in the kitchen. And so I'm working right now on a project that, um, that is, there are a couple of publishers interested in it, and uh, we'll see what happens. But it's basically conversations in the kitchen, and they're not about food. You know, we, we are working with our hands, and we're creating recipes and, and, and making food. But the conversations about life that are taking place are, I think, stories that are worth documenting. And so, uh, in fact, tomorrow, I'm going to be spending a half a day with my mother making <laughs> yalanji. So, you know, it's rolled grape leaves. So, um, and, I, and I think we share a lot of life, all of us, when we're in the kitchen. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that project, too. How do you describe, I mean, your writing style is, is a little unique because, look, you take, I, I guarantee you, you're going to take wrapping that little grape leaf <laughs> and turn it into a 750-word <laughs> column. How do you describe that style of writing? Because I think it's fantastic that, you know, you take things like that and you turn them into stories. Well, I, it, I think it's slowing down. You know, again, we're living in a world that's all about speed, and it's slowing down your breath and your writing and describing in detail a moment and trying to capture that. And I, I, I get lost in those moments because I, like everybody else, my life is, you know, I'm always jamming. I'm always busy on deadline for something. And so when I write, I try to narrow it down to, I try to use all my senses in my writing. I try to describe uh, the details. And if you will, it's sort of like looking at a picture that's inside of a frame. And once you've described what's inside the frame, what's inside of the picture, then what I try to do is look outside of the frame and describe the action that's taking place outside of the frame and let my imagination have some fun. And so, you know, and, and I, that, that's where I get my extra words. It's not what you see, it's what you don't see that I try to describe in my writing. <laughs> and I think that's what my readers most relate to because when they close their eyes, then they, their imagination is sparked as well. This broadcast, the audio version, is being aired uh, from Fresno State's campus, 90.7 FM, uh -huh. KFSR. Fresno State's affiliated with this book somehow. Tell us how. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, I'm a graduate of Fresno State. I love the <laughs> campus. And, and, you know, that university, I was, I took, not too long ago, I told Dr. Castro, this university gave me my wings. If it wasn't for Fresno State, not only would I not have received a college degree, but I wouldn't have gone to Europe to study abroad. I mean, it, it just opened the world for me. Well, in 2008, I went back to Fresno State for four years as in, and participated in the summer arts program. And I studied writing because I had never really formally studied the craft of writing. And during that time, I, I got to know the dean, Vita Samian, at the time, and we became friends. And our offices had worked together as well, you know, uh, the uh, Office of Education and the College of Arts and Humanities. We had partnerships with, with the college. And um, one day, she kind of floated the idea. She said, you know, I know you're working on another book, and we might be interested in publishing it. And I, I didn't know at the time that uh, the university had a press, the press at California State University, Fresno. And um, 
And they published the work of uh, noted authors and also emerging authors. And it was such a magical fit because my stories are all about Fresno and growing up here in the valley. And of course, Fresno State is such a landmark and a, an integral part of our community that it was just a match made in heaven for me. And so uh, I've been spending a lot of time on campus and working with my editor is uh, had just retired from Fresno State um, faculty. And I just have enjoyed every step of this writing journey partnering with the university. You know, we are running out of time this week no, in the no, program. No. I know, because <laughs> we can go for another hour just talking about, you know, what's going on in your life, your projects. So what's next? I mean, other than your working things, I mean, do you have a, another goal? I mean, is there something that you really want to achieve? Because I have a feeling whatever you put your mind to, you're going to get there. Well, you know what? I, I have a passion for traveling. And um, so I love to travel. And, and each time I take a long-distance trip, whether it's to France or Italy or, you know, to, to Greece, um, it sparks new ideas of things I would like to do. But for right now, I'm concentrating. I'm doing a lot of traveling and a lot of speaking engagements about this book and about the importance of telling your story. And it's something I think all of us we need to do, and we need to pass our stories on to our children and our grandchildren. And, um, and, and so right for the next year, I'm going to be really focusing on sharing the messages inside my book and doing a lot of traveling. And, um, and then there'll be some announcements coming up soon. <laughs> we can't wait for those. Thank you. I would love to be the person next to you in an airplane. Because I have a feeling that for the time you're traveling, you're jotting down things, you're writing down things. Do thoughts come to you while you're traveling as well? Oh, yes. I do some of my best thinking when I'm 35,000 feet above sea level. Yes. And, I, and because I love to travel, you know, I, I write a lot about my travels. Because really, you know, when you lose your luggage, when you're uh, away from home, um, those are moments that when you're not safe, you, when, you're, when you're at risk. And it's in those moments when I think sometimes um, we shed that layer of protectiveness and we can really talk about what's going on in our hearts and in our minds. And so I love to travel and, and let myself be a little bit vulnerable and, and, uh, and test the waters. And uh, many of my stories in this book are about my travels in France, Tunisia, uh, Greece, and so I've, I've um, in fact, one of the books I would like to write w is about uh, flight connections and uh, all the travels that I've had during my lifetime. How can we find more information about this book? Where can people purchase it? It's available at Petunia's Place and at Barnes & Noble, and through you can get it online through the press at California State University Fresno, uh, csufresno.org. And, uh, or you can just Google it. It's on Amazon also. And um, it's, it's everywhere right now. And I'm really proud of it. And uh, it's likely that some of your listeners or viewers will uh, be hearing me. I have a lot of speaking engagements coming up. Speaking of Barnes & Noble and speaking engagements, you just did a book signing. Yes, yes. Uh, how did that go? Well, for, you know, I rarely get to meet my readers, <laughs> and they, my, my life is an open book, so, so people who read my columns know just about everything that's going on in my life, but it was fantastic. At both of my big book signings, the Petunia's Place and also Barnes & Noble, hundreds of people came, and they, they were readers who had been fans for years. You know, I've been writing for more than a decade, and I got to actually make eye contact with them and, you know, give them a warm and, uh, hug or shake their hand. And it was wonderful to meet them and, um, and, and get their personal one-on-one -on -one reviews of my writing. It was great. What's the number one thing that people tell you when they come up to you? And let's say your Barnes & Noble book signing, your other book signing. What is it that they're telling you? You know what they say the most? They say, oh, my God, I read this story you wrote. And I nodded all the way through it, <laughs> and I said, yes, that's what I'm feeling, too. And, you know, that's not just the happy stories. That's those moments when, you know, you're teetering, and you're not sure where, what the next moment is going to be like. And, and they say, thank you for giving my life a voice. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, we are all more alike than we are different. 
And I hope that my words speak about the human condition and how we are all connected. And certainly in the San Joaquin Valley, I mean, I think there is a magic here that none of us are strangers, that if we talk for more than five minutes, there are bonds that are forged and relationships made. And I think my readers appreciate that, that I, um, at the end of the day, we're all part of one big family and that we can share our stories together. And they thank me for that. How does that make you feel when that fan or that person reading your work comes up to you and says, that's exactly how I'm feeling. Oh, gosh. There's, <laughs> uh, you know what? It makes me feel full. It's very gratifying because it's petrifying for me. Every time I send a story off and press the send button, I, 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 I'm, I'm so scared because I want to connect with my readers. And so just that validation, that affirmation gives me permission to keep taking those risks with my writing. And I make that pledge to my, to my audience is that I'm not gonna play it safe. I'm gonna challenge myself, but in doing so, I'm challenging everybody to live their life and to be honest and to, you know, like the old woman that I, whose story I love the most said, I dare you to live your life. And I think that's what I wanna do, give us all permission to push the envelope and live out loud and to then share our stories with each other. We are out of time this week on the program. I would love to have you again come by because I have a ton of other questions okay. to ask you. But thank you so much for coming this week on the program. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. That's all for this edition of San Joaquin Spotlight. To the volunteer crew that made this production and every production possible, thank you very much. Today's program was directed by Cesar Campos. To our audience members listening to, to us on 90.7 FM KFSR Fresno. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for watching us on CMAC, Comcast 93, AT&T 99. Our guest this, big, this week has been the one and only Armin Bacon. You can read her in the Fresno Bee or you can check out her new book. I'm your host, Sevog Tatiosian. Tune in next week for a new edition.